team panelists here. Um, so Andrew Keane, I'm sure you all know, uh, self-declared uh, antichrist of Silicon Valley, uh, a professional controversialist, which is a good gig if you can get it, uh, and the author of um, The Cult of the Amateur, How the Internet is Killing Our Culture. So I think you know where he's coming at our first panel today, which is all about internet optimism, uh, pessimism, the future of culture. Uh, to my right is uh, Adam Thier, who I worked with for the uh, last three years at the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Uh, Adam has had a long career in the think tank world at PFF, uh, Cato Heritage, and is now at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And someone that, again, I've, I've really had the great honor of working with and who I look up to as a mentor um, and have been ha happy and proud to have as a co-author. Uh, on my left, uh, Ann Bartow teaches at the University of South Carolina School of Law. Her scholarship focuses on intellectual property, uh, as well as privacy, technology, law, and feminist uh, legal theory. Uh, and I promise Anne that in future we will, we will make every effort to uh, correct the great gender imbalance in our field. Uh, Jonathan Zittrain is not here today, as you can tell, uh, but he is here in spirit. He had to teach all day. Uh, but his, his uh, chapter in the book um, is really essential to this, this topic that we'll be talking about here today. So Frank Pasquale, who's who has uh, two essays in the book on uh, later chapters, has been kind enough to join us on this panel um, to speak out a little bit for the, what, what I would call a certain sort of pessimism. I, um, and since he's writing a book called The Black Box, I think he might, he might agree that that's a little bit pessimistic. So that, that's not meant to be a loaded term. But, um, uh, but Frank uh, teaches uh, law at um, uh, Seton Hall and is now a visiting fellow at Princeton's University Center for Information Technology Policy. So I want to thank all of you here today. And um, just by way of background, want to explain that this panel is a combination of two chapters in the book. The first two chapters are about um, the future of culture, and that's where uh, Adam and uh, Andrew and, um, and Anne have their essays. And the second chapter is about um, pessimism generally, um, and that's where, where Adam, I think, articulates his, his second theory of pessimism. So, Adam, do you want to kick us off by just explaining what you mean by those, those two schools of pessimism? Well, sure. Thanks, Baron. And I want to congratulate you and Tech Freedom on your successful launch today. Uh, of the many people I've had the pleasure of working with over the past 20 years and four, actually five different think tanks now, baron has been uh, one of the biggest joys and uh, a great Padawan learner that I know will never turn to the dark side. So, <laughs> or else I will slay him. So, uh, uh, congratulations, Baron, and uh, it's really exciting. I know you're going to make a huge contribution. And, and I space. should explain that uh, Jeff uh, Manny suggested that this was a geek, excuse me, Eric Goldman, this is a geek on geek event. <laughs> so, there may be Star Trek and be uh, Star Wars yeah. and perhaps even Dungeons and Dragons references. To Some that. lightsaber play will ensue. So, very briefly, uh, I have two contributions to uh, this book, and, and what a book it is. It's an amazing collection of essays, really the, the all-stars of cyber law, really uh, 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 aggregated uh, in this book. And my contributions uh, have to do with uh, internet optimism and pessimism and the, the case uh, that is made against the internet. And what, what I've tried to do in my introductory chapter is to discuss the, the two variants of internet pessimism as I see them developing today uh, in the field of cyber law and internet policy. The, the, the first variant I think will be fairly familiar to everyone here, and I, I think Andrew is a, a fairly uh, good exponent of it in, in a lot of his work, uh, the, this sort of dour, pessimistic view that, that somehow there's, there's not a lot of hope that the internet is really going to change society, culture, humanity for the better. That it really is a, uh, you know, there was a supposed good old days when things were much better and the internet, uh, this newfangled thing, is, is ultimately going to uh, take us to a different world and not a better one. Um, I wouldn't say that this variant of pessimism is Ludditism. It doesn't always, uh, it's not always represented with radical calls for, you know, uh, break the machines, you know, let's roll back the clock. But the it, it, it sometimes borders on it, and it certainly calls into question the wisdom of continuing to go down the path of further, further digitization, uh, a broadening of the internet and the scope of these technologies in our lives, so on and so forth. Um, the second variant of pessimism that I've identified, which may be a little less familiar to some, and some would claim it's not pessimism, uh, is a pessimism from people who actually embrace the internet in some ways. They're what I would call net lovers. But they are very pessimistic about the future of the internet, or the future of openness, or the future of, as Jonathan Zittrain calls it, 
generativity and generative devices. And it's not just Jonathan that's the, probably the, he's probably the leading exponent of this theory, thesis right now, but in his book, The Future of uh, the Internet and How to Stop It, but it really started with Larry Lessig's code, uh, which is in many ways a Bible for this, the field of cyber law and, and the place where most uh, students begin their study of it. And it, it, when you read between the lines, or not even between the lines, when you read them directly, Larry's book is, is a fairly dark book because it opens with this notion that, as Barron's already mentioned, that left unfettered cyberspace will lead to a world of perfect control. And that the code is law kind of notion that he set forth there is really uh, talking, it's an effort by him to foreshadow a world where private code actually leads to more law on our lives and therefore we need actual law to regulate that private code. So Jonathan's new book, uh, Future of the Internet, How to Stop It, and more recently Tim Wu's new book, The Master Switch, are really in my mind sort of a, a trilogy of sorts that really uh, expose and discuss, uh, delineate the confines of this theory of, uh, of internet policy. And, it, you know, the attitude on display in these books seems to be one of, uh, it seems to imply that we're at the cusp of the, the, the beginning of a digital dark age of closed systems, where everything's being closed up and uh, corporate American, you know, schemers are sort of uh, taking over our cyber liberties, you know, and uh, I, I've disputed this in more articles and blog posts than I care to, to, to number, but in my second chapter in the book, I try to challenge that view by making the argument that actually things are probably more open than they ever have been before. They're more generative than they ever have been before. And that, quite frankly, I think we have more reasons for optimism than ever before. Um, so I haven't gotten into detail about either of my uh, theories in terms of debunking these notions of pessimism, but maybe it's a good chance for me to hand off and... Uh, yeah, well, well, Frank, uh, since you're here sort of channeling uh, Wu, Lessig, and Zittrain, um, again, <laughs> Wu, Wu and, and Zittrain both have essays in the book and just couldn't, couldn't be here. Why don't you stand up for the, what I would think is the, the dominant trend in, in Internet law? Sure, and thanks so much for the invitation. It really is a is a tribute to your open mindedness that you would you would have me here. Um, <laughs> I I think that it is um, to talk to give a presence of, of Lessig wounds a train is a pretty tough job. But let me try to give the Cliff Notes version. I think of, of how they might respond uh, to Adam's point and the, the blog I run called Conquering Opinions. We had a symposium on the future of the internet. Um, we had some great posts from Adam and, and others there. We're doing one on Tim Wu's Master Switch next month. I've gotten about halfway through that. Another very interesting read. Um, and of course, there's Lessig. And I, I think the argument that all of these thinkers are making, I think, um, or where they converge, if there is sort of a school of internet studies that can be called, um, say, progressive internet studies, rather than, I think, pessimistic internet studies, because I think, ultimately, what they're trying to do is to try to assure progress towards some better endpoint. Um, and to situate internet studies within a larger progressive agenda. Um, I think that there's a, there's a main point of that. One is that you've got to look at a lot of the leading powers on the internet the way that we've looked at utilities in the past. Okay? And when I would make this analogy in the article Federal Search Commission I did about a couple of years ago and others uh, had made that analogy, you know, people are willing to think about that in the terms of ISPs, uh, they're willing to think about that in terms of cable and phone companies. Um, five years ago when I started making arguments like this, no one was willing to entertain it. But we've sort of seen gradually over time that there are incredible network effects. There's ways in which, you know, if you look at Larry Downs' essays, uh, he talks about information economics, Hal Varian as well. These experts have talked about the way in which there are sort of unstoppable snowballing network effects towards dominance in certain areas. And I think that we're, we're reaping that now in some areas like in search engines and in social networks. And I think that once we take that seriously, we see people like Rebecca McKinnon writing her uh, book, Consent of the Networked. Um, we see Dana Boyd, who has a wonderful post asking, is Facebook a utility? Other thought like that. Then we start seeing the necessary analogies between what's going on in that nowadays and what types of regulation affected the media in the past. So I think that that first point is to beware of monopoly. The second point, I think, which is a far more, and we can have tons of fun debates about the first point. The second point, which I think is far more difficult for the libertarian perspective to really take on and to grapple with nowadays, is the growing fusion between the corporate and the governmental sector. And they even have certain institutions called fusion centers which exemplify this. Centers which involve um, co-location of private sector entities and public entities involving mass data surveillance. 
So when you have a world in which you have extraordinary concentration and collaboration of power in those ways, then the chapter of Zetrain's book on the future of privacy and his worries about privacy 2.0, I think, are very serious. And I think there was just a piece on Frontline last night about the Maryland Fusion Center, tracking uh, 53 Democratic activists, including two nuns, you know, through all sorts of sophisticated ways. And I think the internet, we've got to acknowledge that that allows that type of tracking, that type of, of collaboration. Um, finally, I think one under-noticed under uh, piece of Zetrain's is a piece that he did called Ubiquitous Human Computing, which just talks about the internet as a accelerator of inequality in many ways. Okay. Uh, just what Walgreen, what, what Walmart has done, I think, in much of, of the world, in many ways it's a positive thing, but in many ways we have to acknowledge that, you know, it, it's, it puts a certain central node, gives them a lot of power to sort of dictate terms that can often be kind of difficult, uh, very difficult labor terms, you know, in other countries where it sort of create, it, it lowers transaction costs and it creates this sort of global, worldwide economic um, market. I think the same thing can be happening on the internet too. You see like uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk giving out atomized human intelligence tasks at like one to 10 cents each. Okay. And I think that when you look at some of the dystopian features of that possible, of those possibilities, when you see that potentially not just manufacturing but the whole service sector ends up getting outsourced, that should worry folks and it even worries libertarians. If you look at Robin Hansen's work on the technological singularity, look at Robert Hansen's discussion with Russ Roberts uh, a couple of weeks ago, Fascinating discussion, okay? And there's a very honest libertarian perspective that's rather bleak about the future of sort of human welfare and the possibilities for any form of equality in that realm of technological advance. So I tend to think of Google as sort of a, Wal a Walmart slash Goldman uh, in its sort of intermediary power, and I want to go into that later on uh, in more detail. But I think any of those concerns you have, if you have any concerns about large financial institutions or large retailers as intermediaries with lots of power, you should have those about uh, internet institutions. Except, of course, the Google slogan might be no prices always instead of no <laughs> prices always. Mm -hmm. Well, so well I, I, would, I would recommend looking at Ben Edelman's look, uh, work on the setting of reserve prices and auctions for Google AdWords before you know, being uh, too taken in by the freemium branding of Google services for users. So I, th I think this is a pretty good... Um, setting forth of, of that first current of, of, uh, of debate. I do want to get Anne to sort of explain Jonathan Zittrain's particular concept of generativity and openness. And then, Andrew, why don't you kind of tell us your own perspective on, um, on, on the Internet and the future of culture. So, Anne. Okay. All right. Well, um, so Jonathan Zittrain wrote this book called The Future of the Internet. And um, I really actually like the book a lot. Um, but I wrote a kind of harsh uh, review essay anyway because, you know, it's much more fun. Uh, uh, to disagree than it is to agree, right? So that was great. Uh, move on. No, no, no. I got all kinds of uh, interesting little twists and takes on it. Um, I love the internet. I don't know what I did with my free time before the internet. I definitely had a lot more of it then. Um, but there are aspects of the internet that are very challenging. So I've been following cyber law and trying to write in cyber law since I started teaching, which was almost 14 years ago. And one of the things I can't help noticing is that 14 years ago, there were a whole lot more women uh, in every aspect. There are more women in the industry doing computer science. This is all documentable. Uh, more women in computer science and academia who were kind of observing trends in writing. And then in cyber law, in, in my own field, there were more women writing about cyber law then than there are now uh, proportionately, but also just numerically. Uh, they've moved on to other things for various reasons, and I find that kind of alarming. So when I read Jonathan's book, um, I couldn't help noticing that he, most of the folks that Frank was talking about show up in his book. We have, you know, Tim Wu and Larry Lessig, of course, and uh, David Post and David Johnson and some of the early people, early adopters to cyber law, and there were almost no women. He cites almost no women in the entire book, and it's not so much that he doesn't cite to women, because it's hard to find, as I said, the, the number has sh shrunk, but he doesn't seem to really care that, you know, 51% of the population doesn't seem to have much of a presence on the internet. This is something Yochai Benkler, when he wrote about uh, the internet also, um, he didn't mention porn, which was an enormous, very gendered section Wait, of the internet. You, with a, there's porn on the internet? <laughs> I know, shocking, <laughs> shocking. Um, yeah, it's uh, hard, hard to believe that. It's uh, uh, You know, it's like funny, and people say stuff like uh, uh, someone who shall be nameless who writes in cyber law was uh, saying, well, you know, I just don't understand what the problem is. You, you, you won't find porn. You know, you couldn't, if you don't want, go looking for it, you won't find porn. It's like, what planet are you on? Like, just come look at my Google inbox or my Yahoo inbox on any given day. 
Uh, don't even, okay, so one time I actually, I didn't know how to spell the expression lickety split, so I Googled <laughs> it. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that, especially not in class. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, I mean, so there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. I'm not trying to generalize about how we should think about it, but the, the fact that no one is talking about it, no one is thinking about it kind of alarms me. So when I read, I have a lot of respect for Jonathan. When I read his book, I had a lot of things to learn about the book. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned was that it's, you know, even more sort of masculinized and the people that are theorizing it don't seem to know or care uh, the way, you know, they may talk about less diversity, but his view of diversity is, is a very... Uh, male view of diversity, you know, within men, are, are we diverse, or something along those lines. So I titled my review essay, A Portrait of the Internet as a Young Man, because I really felt that was him and that was his view of kind of the evolving internet. So as, as Frank laid out, he has a, at least one of the things he's concerned about is this idea of uh, generativity being really important and companies, you know, going against that, that the trend being to things, he calls it baked, right? It's kind of funny for a, a man, he works about giving birth and baking things, right? So there are all these sort of feminine concepts that kind of wind up in his view of the internet, but it's, it's guys that are doing it. They're procreating. They're actually giving birth. He has Larry Lustig giving birth uh, in the book. <laughs> but so, so bakedness and generativity, and he comes down harshly in favor of generativity, but his very first story out of the box is that, um, you know, the early Apple computers, especially because they Apple made some mistakes about licensing software, that the fact that people kind of spontaneously came up with applications and ways to use their early Apple computers really made the company, which I think uh, is, is pretty indisputable. Uh, so then he says, and now we contrast that with the iPhone, which, you know, at least when it was launched, and, and Jonathan actually has one, uh, was very baked, okay, that you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And, and, and that's, that's what he means by generativity. I mean, That's not, one of the things he means by concept, right. So maybe if you could just give a little more. Oh, okay, detail. sure. So well, generativity comes up in different in different um, aspects, but it it means the ability to manipulate technology, um, uh, to come in as as you know to buy a phone and to be able to do it yourself. So how many of you have actually iPhones, and then how many have uh, Droid? Okay, and I have a, okay. So th those are two options, and and in some ways they're different, at least initially, because the iPhone was at least according to Zitron kind of baked, and the Droid was a little more open. But both of those have changed. That the iPhone now there's a lot more apps and a lot more ability to buy independent apps and develop apps. So Apple became sort of more generative, and then the Droid had so many problems with apps that didn't work that there's actually maybe less, you know, kind of a, a happy medium. And I don't think that maybe Jonathan necessarily saw that as a option uh, in his book. Uh, the other thing I would just say quickly, and I know you want to move on, is just um, his view of cyberspace law in the book, and actually he seems to be writing a little bit differently, is also there's not a lot of law in cyber law. That the people who are going to make the changes were technologists of goodwill who are going to sort of decide what the best way to go was, and there are all these kind of men uh, who are going to decide what the best way the internet should go and implement the changes through technology, and it's never really clear, like with the Apple stuff, or if we're going to force them to be generative, how are we going to do that? Are we going to have a law that they have to be generative? Are we going to hack them? Are we going to make hacking legal so that we can hack them? And if we are going to make hacking legal, how are we going to make sure only like the good kind of hacking happens where you develop better apps and that the bad actors don't then take advantage of this uh, openness? So this is all a lot of interesting things that book raises. So, so the theme thus far is openness, closeness, mm -hmm. control, and freedom. I think it's Fair to say, right? And there are, I think, three very different perspectives up here. I, I think Andrew's critique is is um, starts from a different place, so you might touch on some of the same themes. Do you want to give us your short um, version of why you are the Antichrist of Silicon Valley? Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, nice to be here. Um, <laughs> that sounded very sincere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm confused by a lot of things, but generally, but I, I've never under. I come from a culture, firstly, where we don't have professors of law. Law is a trade. So I've never figured out what law professors do. And uh, now I know they study, they, they analyze the internet for what, uh, male bias? Uh, you know, it's I mean, a living. It's a, exactly. Um, a, a kind of living, I guess. Uh, who's paying you to do that? <laughs> the taxpayers of the state of South Carolina. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, my interest is not in the law. I don't understand what the law has to do with the internet. I think one of the problems is, uh, you know, that a lot of these law professors who clearly have nothing better to do than write books about the internet have seized control of this debate when they don't, when they're not in the, the business of media. Um, you know, all these law professors are are paid to they're, they're paid by their law schools to churn out articles that have no market value. 
So um, they have no understanding of media. They have no understanding. Like I'm a, I'm a paid author. Um, so when I put my work out on the market, people decide whether or not they want to buy it. And I make my living by exchanging my intellectual property, my creativity, um, in, in market terms. Uh, and, and law professors don't understand that because they have, most of them have tenure. And they're paid to churn out stuff that has no market value. And their value is in teaching, which, you know, some of them probably are good teachers. Um, and my interest in the internet and my critique of the internet is as a market system which is struggling at the moment to, to pay the creative class, to pay writers, musicians, filmmakers, journalists. So my work uh, analyzes the internet as, a, as an economic system. I'm not interested in the law. I don't care about it one way or the other, as long as I don't get arrested. Um, I'm interested in the internet as a replacement for old media. So we have these two terms, old and new media. Old media is going away. We all know that, for better or worse. It's a reality. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against technology as such. I don't want to hold it up. I don't want to you know, smash the machines or anything like that. I'm as wired as anyone. Um, but what concerns me in my critique is the failure of this new media to provide an economic environment to pay the creative class. Um, and uh, I analyze or I, I look at this in two or three different ways. Firstly, I'm critical of um, the so-called, you know, the, the, the idealists who, democrat who believe that the profession, the old media professional class is a bad thing, that they're elites. I, I rejoice in that elitism. I like, I'm in the Barry Diller school. Except, where, except for law professors. <laughs> right. Well, I don't consider them to be part of an elite of any kind. <laughs> uh, um, so I think there's always a, a small group of people who have talent, God-given sometimes, sometimes through hard work who have the ability to, to create things of value and sell that value in the marketplace. In the industrial media economy, it was done through, you know, television and radio and books and all the rest of it. We all know, you know, need to, need to tell you about that. My concern is in the internet, you have two or three things which are undermining that professional class. Firstly, you have the, 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 the curse of piracy and the open culture, free content people who take pleasure, I think, in the demise of large media, who see all media in kind of Gramscian terms as some sort of plot by a hegemonic class to control the intellectual agenda, old-fashioned argument. Um, and then, uh, the, the, so, so that's one problem. Uh, and the, the other problem is struggling, and I still don't see, I see some, you know, my, I, you call me a pessimist. In some ways, I am. But in some ways, I'm, you know, I believe in models like Netflix and Spotify. What concerns me is the way in which the internet is emerging to monetize content and to guarantee that writers, filmmakers, musicians, journalists are paid for their work. Um, and that's why I was pessimistic, particularly in response to Web 2.0. My essay in this book is about Web 2.0 and the exuberance of the people who argued, you know, the long tail kind of argument, that we're all going to become producers, blah, blah, you all know that argument, that's proved to be wrong. Uh, so I'm defending a professional creative class. I want to make sure that the internet becomes a platform, a mechanism, a vehicle for the distribution of that content. I think it benefits everyone. I think it benefits, obviously, that creative class, but it also benefits consumers and citizens because if consumers and citizens are not exposed or have access to high quality entertainment and, in, uh, and, it, and particularly information, then they're certainly worse citizens. And they're also, I think, pure, poorer human beings. So that's, that's why I was and to some extent still remain a pessimist, although in some ways I think I'm increasingly optimistic, particularly, I think, given the way in which, you know, the struggle against piracy seems to be winning in some ways. And there are more and more innovative business models for monetizing content on the internet. But I just want to be clear, I'm not against technology. Technology for me um, is, is a mirror. When we look at the internet, we're looking at ourselves. So these are 
These are cultural and economic arguments. They have nothing to do with technology. So, Adam, uh, if you could try to bring this home for us without uh, insulting any, anyone on the podium or any classes of the audience. Or law professors. Yeah, sure. Just we can take uh, how do you tie this together? Uh, well, I, I think what Andrew's articulating here is a, is a theory of, uh, and maybe it's not pessimism, uh, internet skepticism that basically suggests that old institutions, norms, and values are being challenged or even potentially are crumbling right before our eyes and that this is a difficult technological transition. And we have had these before. You go back, and I start my chapter by going back to the great story of uh, Plato has in the Phaedrus of uh, King Famous and, and the god Thuth and the debate about the impact of writing on culture and how it will destroy oral uh, tradition, spoken tradition around a campfire. Well, guess what? You know, there was some truth to that story that Plato told. I mean, we've no longer memorized long stories and told them around a campfire. We read them off of a, a scroll or something. But you know what? My, my take on all of this, it comes down to two words. Humans adapt. We, we, we learn to live with technological change. There are gut-wrenching changes uh, in, in our midst today because of the Internet. The question of how to secure and monetize intellectual property is one of the, the foremost and most difficult questions on that list. And I'm actually very sympathetic to some of those concerns that Andrew's uh, raised, and he knows that. Uh, but, but I'm also, I think, a little bit more optimistic than him that the, we will find positive responses because we will learn. We will learn how to embrace and, and use this technology in a, in a, in a better way. I, I also try to make a pragmatic point in response to some of the, the criticisms and, and concerns that Andrew and, and others have raised which is that let's say that he's right and that things are as bad as he says, suggests. Uh, again, I don't buy that, but what do you want to do about it? I mean, how do you put the information genie back in the bottle? Because I think, uh, as I point out in the book, you know, the, sort of the, the, the wind in the sails of all the optimists would be the fact that they know that t the, the natural progression of technology is one of constant change and evolution, and barring really heavy-handed measures or, or steps, it's hard to disrupt these things. I think the better approach is one of education, empowerment, teaching people how to embrace new tools and technologies, how to cope with disruptive technological change. Because what I don't think I saw in Andrew's book and some of the other work of other skeptics is the answer to that question. What do you want to do to stop this, this nature of this change? So, so that's, again, that's the first chapter of the book, is this debate about uh, Andrew's pessimism, your optimism. But what about this, this second sort of what you call net-loving pessimism, the skepticism about unregulated technology and whether progress will really happen without government intervening, which is what Frank was really getting at and what uh, Anne is kind of responding to in her review of Jonathan's book. So in response to some of what Frank said and in, in my essays responding to Jonathan and, and to, to Tim, Tim Wu, uh, I've tried to make the argument, you've already stolen a lot of my thunder here, Baron, about talking about <laughs> dynamism uh, earlier on because you know how passionately I feel about that framework of the importance of evolutionary dyn dynamism in a, in a free society. The fact is, is that we find ways to embrace these sorts of things and, and make change work for the better. I think the problem with the, the worldview that, that Tim and, uh, and that Frank and others have is that they're too quick to jump the gun on momentary marketplace hiccups being catastrophes, a sort of call in the moment, chicken little moment where, you know, call in the cops moment where we have to say, hey, the code cops need to come in and set things right. We're never going to evolve around this. I mean, we, we've heard these things before, right? I mean, you, you look at IBM in the 60s and 70s and Microsoft more recently. I mean, I, I've just always found it hard to believe that we need to have immediate interventions when patience proves to usually be the better prescription um, because in my view it's what it's at a market's darkest moment when it may look like it's all closed and sterile and non-generative when the most exciting forms of innovation are happening uh, that's what's the kick in the pants to innovators to say you need to get off your duff and you know create the next disruptive technology to take down IE if you don't like it and that's exactly what the folks you know, working at Netscape and then went on, went on, would come to, uh, came to be known as, you know, Firefox and Mozilla, they did. And then Google did. Disruptive technology works if you give it a chance. Well, can I right. respond to that? I mean, I, I do think there's a lot, there's been a ton of disruptive technology and, and really wonderful innovations on the internet. I think, though, the two points, though, one is that the kind of program that people like like me are, are advancing. And I don't even think that Tim Wu offers really a program. I mean, when you look at the end of the master switch, all he really is arguing for is a sort of constitution of freedom. I mean, he, he has been arguing for net neutrality, but I think if you look at the, his latest work, he's basically saying, 
to the extent there's going to be good behavior, it's going to have to be due to sort of in norms of the lead actors. I mean, I think that's the direction he's going. Um, so train also, as, as Anna's pointed out, I think very eloquently in her view, um, really relies on non-state actors. I am one of the few people that, you know, has, has stuck my neck out and said, well, here's some ideas for what we could do. What I think the state could do, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commissions, other entities. And But the things I've proposed are, are minimal. I mean, the things I propose are, are just trying to make sure that the FTC can understand what's going on. You know, that's what I think is important. I think that there are so many ways in which the litigation process uh, where people feel slighted or feel, other, other, feel somehow that their results have come out in a way that really they shouldn't have or feel there are privacy violations, that they can't really even look under the hood of key internet, internet intermediaries. And we just know so little about them. Randall Strauss's book, Planet Google, says, you know, we don't know if there's 100,000 computers or a million computers. You know, there's just so many ways in which I worry that, the, and the reason why I'm writing this book called The Black Box Society is that I worry that we can't have a really free, open, and democratic society if you've got extremely powerful institutions at the center uh, both on the internet and on Wall Street that are totally opaque. The last point that I'll make is about, you know, what I think is are two interesting convergences of libertarian thought and Marxism. And one is, the sort of, Marx had an immiseration hypothesis. He would say, well, don't give the workers welfare because the worse things get, the more likely they will be to revolt. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard, don't try to regulate, you know, the ISPs, et cetera, because the worse they make it, the more you like you'll get a disruptive innovation. You know, maybe you will. I don't know. I mean, when Google was buying up black fiber or dark fiber, you know, that was possibly a plausible argument that they were trying to make an end run around the key players. But as Tim Wu discovered to his chagrin, you know, he was a big supporter of Google. Ultimately, they decided it was easier to partner with them. It's easier to partner with the, the Verizon Google deal, you know. And I, I was looking at that with Comcat, with Clearwire uh, back in 2008. I, I predicted that basically you would see vertical integration of the layers. You wouldn't see this sort of effort by one layer to shake up the business of the other. The second sort of Marxist aspect of it is just, you know, that we hear so much about capture. That's a very Marxian theory. The bourgeois, the, the state is nothing but executive committee of the bourgeois. Okay, So, so I think that there, there are ways in which overly sort of radical approaches to the existing order can wrap around, the left and the right can wrap around and meet together. And I, I what I'm trying to, dis, to defend is an ongoing role for what I think has been a, a successful third way or at least a third way that offers some promise to understand what's going on, which is the foundation of, of any regulation, any uh, sort of progress, progressive action we can make in the internet field. Ian? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually was going to uh, maybe be a little grumpy for a second on the issue of dynamism and some of the practical effects of dynamism, because I actually, um, uh, despite the onslaught of insults, have to agree with some of the things Andrew said um, in terms of content owners and where things go with a little bit different. It's not, um, I think musicians and authors and movie makers have adapted. I think there's actually kind of a mixed bag in terms of who gets compensated in the models that they found and maybe some, uh, good edges actually just uh, to stop for the movies for a second. I just, um, I, I've started doing these things, running these 200 mile relays with my distance running team, which sounds kind of crazy. And it is kind of crazy. You get like 12 people, you run 200 miles without stopping. So you're up for 36 hours in a, in a van. And by the end, you're really tired, crabby, you smell real bad. But it's outrageously fun. But it's kind of a niche thing. And uh, some the, uh, the first relay was Hood to Coast. That was the initial one. It was in Oregon from Mount Hood to the coast. And so it took place last Labor Day. And people made a, document, a, a documentary film about it because they could, right? They're using the technology, they could make it. And then using just sort of all the geeky runners, we're all kind of hooked up to the internet, we've had, there was an audience, right? There was an ability for us to bring it to our theaters and talk to each other and bring people together for a function. And the internet made all that possible. So here's a group of people who never would have made a film that was going to be at all, you know, profitable or find an audience in any way before the internet. So that's kind of the happy side. The grumpy side is, um, so South Carolina has a couple of new, very, very ailing newspapers, right? Mainstream media. And, uh, you know, we have a journalism school, but most of the kids that seem to graduate our journalism school want to go into marketing. They don't want to you know, be muckrakers, and we could use some muckraking in South Carolina <laughs> because we have some muck, um, and <laughs> it needs to be raked. Uh, but in any event, uh, so we have this newspaper called The State. And again, I moved to South Carolina. The state actually was kind of feisty, and it would take on different issues. And the University of South Carolina had some muck. 
and um, you know you tell like, Dean muck you but you know it didn't really happen and you needed somebody kind of a neutral person who would kind of look at our endowment and why every other endowment why is Clemson endowment thriving and ours isn't what kind of investments are being made all these kind of questions and the newspaper was kind of feisty about this but then the coverage of the university dwindled and at some point they laid off uh, every reporter was the you know, they just stopped covering the university altogether, uh, and the reason they did this was their their presence went from being uh, in real space on paper and ink into the internet, and as soon as they were on the internet, they could see what interested people, and you know what interests people in South Carolina: sports, crime, weather, and death. Right, the obituaries. That's it. So that's how they ramped up their sports. They ramped up their coverage of crime. They ramped up their weather, and they ramped up their debt. Well, the obituaries um, uh, didn't start killing people, as far as I know. But the people, the people like me who wanted to see the university covered, were very few and far between. No one was kicking on those articles, so, uh, clicking on those articles. So they stopped. So you know that was a dynamism. But boy, I, you know, to me, that's a, that's a really bad thing. Um, uh, just another more, uh, and you may have seen something like that happen with your local newspapers. On a more macro scale, uh, you all have antivirus protection, right? Do you ever like sit back and go, wow, what an awesome deal for these antivirus companies. It's just a constant revenue stream. You just keep subscribing, subscribing, subscribing. Who writes these viruses? And when you think about who, you know, yeah, there's a few people that are just sort of bad acting vandals, but there's a real profit incentive motive for viruses to keep happening here to kind of force us all to keep subscribing and there's a dynamism story there that's maybe a little alarming too. Well, I, I want to come back to you in a minute about generativity and your responses to it, but Adam, this is begging for response. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, we could go into a whole, you know, future of journalism discussion there and you know, Maybe I, you should write a 100-page filing about you know, that. You know, I should. Wait. Which is available online in case you want to read. And it's 120 it pages. Thank you very much. Uh, but, uh, you know, look, there is a whole proceeding on, underway at the FCC and the FTC, both on this question of the future of news and journalism. And, and, the, and these are dark days for a lot of traditional media institutions. The Internet has been a highly disruptive force in societies I've already mentioned. And... Nobody has been more disintermediated than traditional new media, news, entertainment operations. Um, again, what do you want to do about it is question one. But question two is, you know, are there ways that we can find to live with this, that we can find to evolve? And, and you know, the way I look at it, and when I, I look increasingly through the prism of the eyes of my children, my, eyes, my, my children, the way they reflect the new media culture, I mean, the way they consume media, and these kids aren't starving for information the way I was when I was growing up. They are subject to information overload. And uh, it's a question of how to filter all the, the great stuff that's available to them. Now, there's a lot of crap, too. You know, the cost of living in an age of information abundance is you've got to sort through all the shit to find the gems. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of crap out there. And I have to help my daughter be a good media literate, you know, student. My, my son, not so much. He's still a dimwit. But, you know, my, my, my daughter... He, she really gets, you know, this stuff because I'm teaching her how to be a savvy media consumer. We've got to do that as a culture, as a society. Now, if you want to be a pessimist and say, well, it's, it's you know, all these institutions struggling, they're all going under, you know, there's no hope, we're all going to be, you know, cave dwellers soon. I, I, I'm sorry. I think that that's unwarranted. Uh, I've heard that story before. We heard it with the rise of the printing press, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, you can go back and trace this stuff throughout history. We do, as humans, change. We have the uncanny ability as mammals to do this. And I think I'm optimistic for that reason because I've seen it happen before. I've not personally seen it, but we know from history uh, we can get through these So, so Adam, it sounds like you're, you're implying part of your response to Frank. When Frank suggests that, um, that the libertarian response is just to sort of sit back, let things get awful, and then the invisible hand will take care of things, you're implying that there's actually, there are many levels at which we ought to deal with technological change both in terms of whether it's good for us or whether it leads to control. And what you're getting at right there is, is education on the very personal household level. But could you talk a little bit about how you see um, market forces actually working in, in the market? Yeah, br briefly. I want to get, get others' input on this. I mean, but, you know, Frank's taught me today that I'm a closet Marxist, which I never knew before, <laughs> which is incredible. I guess it's the new Lenin look I've got going. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, again, I've already kind of made this point, so I don't want to belabor it, but... I, I do think there is something to be said for the dynamism vision of the, the belief that, you know, markets aren't static and that the snapshot mentality that I critique in my second chapter in this book is prevalent in a lot of the work that we see out there in the field of Internet policy and cyber law today. These short-term static snapshots we take of a marketplace and say, oh, God, look at the market power of so-and-so. 
I mean, and I tell the story at length in my chapter about AOL. I mean, does anybody remember just 10 years ago that we were refer refer referring to that as the new big brother, the rise of new totalitarianisms? Where These were terms. I've got all the citations, all the chapter and verse of what people were saying about AOL and then AOL Time Warner. Again, that, <laughs> it fell apart after less than seven years, lost $100 billion for shareholders. I mean, Lessig's book is written in sort of like the, the AOL walled garden model was going to take us all over. And then, you know, you know, code 2.0 is like, you know, let me erase that part and just, you know, move along to something else. You know, because the villain had to change. And in Jonathan's book, Jay-Z's book, we find it's, it's Apple and Steve Jobs and also TiVo. TiVo, I don't get it, but there it is. You know, TiVo and the iPhone on page one and page, you know, 350 or whatever it ends the book. They're the villains that we have to look out for. And I'm sorry, but I mean, they're not, that's not the end of the story. You don't have to own an iPhone. I don't know why Zitrain does. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that you have choices. And markets will evolve to give you better choices. That We have to set a benchmark. There has to be a yardstick where we say, compared to this, are we or are we not better off? And my yardstick always, go back, always goes back to the days, my earliest days with experience with media and technology, when I had so few choices. And when we as humans were starving for information, we, had, we were living in information poverty. And now every other book that comes across my de desk that I'm reviewing these days is about how to cope with information abundance. What are we going to do about all this choice? The, you know, oh, all these choices are making us miserable. I'll take that over the past any day of the week. Uh, give me abundance and the problems thereof over scarcity. All right, I'll shut up. Now. Well, I want to take questions from the audience, but Anne, could, could you maybe just kind of wrap things up? Because you also, this is part of your critique of Jonathan's yeah. book, is, is not being specific enough about responses. Uh, right. That is, so he describes this problem of openness, and you cast this in in somewhat genderized mm -hmm. terms, and you have this critique of uh, the male elite that Jonathan thinks will sort of watch over the internet and make sure that uh, that the right balance is struck uh, between openness and closeness, and yeah. Adam's arguing that that sort of happens in the marketplace right. anyway. Just kind of fill out your critique, tell us okay. what it is that you think he, he does and doesn't say or should say about how we ought to respond to um, to how companies strike that balance, whether they're too much controlling what we do with our devices. Okay. Well, well, actually, just to, to supplement just very briefly some of the things Adam was saying, I mean, Jonathan makes a really sort of scary case for the baked, you know, generative stuff. And, you know, I like to think I'm at least somewhat tech savvy, but I mean, I was talking about the antivirus um, case, uh, other stuff. I mean, I'm really glad uh, that is tethered, right? Like every time Adobe wants to update my ability to open PDFs and all this other kind of stuff, I don't want to have to deal with doing this manually. I'm really happy. Uh, even though, you know, they collect some information on me and maybe they make it so I can't change my mastery of the PDF, I don't want to actually have to deal with that. I want to focus on there are certain things that I alter to my own specifications and don't. I think maybe Zitrin doesn't make enough room for that. Um, he's critical. One of the things he was critical of and, and was... And by that you mean, again, striking the right balance. Right, that right, right. This evolving medium. Thank you. Place. Thank you for grounding me and making me get to the point. I did have one. Um, one of the things Jonathan uh, criticizes, again, and, and, and many of the stories he tells that I found particularly um, surprising and uh, was OnStar. Because, like, first of all, I don't even really get why that's an Internet technology, right? Because his definition of Internet was, was extremely broad, I thought, to include OnStar. Um, and he's very critical of OnStar because OnStar always knows where you are and can report back to the mothership. I'm like, that's the point of OnStar. Right? The point of OnStar is for people who are kind of fearful that somehow they'll get lost or call a breakdown and they won't be able to find their cell phone or the battery will be dead and they want to push a button and have just other people deal with it. And you know, if folks want that and they're willing to pay for it and somebody wants to provide the service, there's like nothing there that scares me. Uh, well, okay, except that those people are on the road driving next to me. That's maybe a little alarming. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, again, like, why, you know, the market kind of solves that. Um, I, I was at a, another conference where people were kind of railing about privacy in a certain particular way, and one of the people who shall be nameless, another law professor, uh, was talking about, you know, the oh, threats to privacy, your cell phone has a, you know, a number, and people can track you and know, always know where you are with your cell phone, how alarming this is. Well, the night before, I got out for drinks with him, and we found the bar by using the cell phone GPS Google Maps. Like, thank God, we'd still be walking around San Francisco otherwise. So, you know, it's a trade-off. Yeah, okay, they always know where you are, but that's really, really useful. Well, when they're you're trying to find directions, they can tell you, here's where you are, here's where you should turn left uh, and, and find your way around. So again, I think uh, Zitrin is just painting, you know, he has a thesis and he just, 
he just, I think, stresses out to fit all these stories into a thesis. Like, I really like his stories, and I think they're all really interesting, but I don't think they so, cohere. So, so, so what is the thesis exactly? The thesis is that, you know, generative is better, and we should somehow work toward that end, but then it completely, as you point out, breaks down how we're going to get there, right? Him and his cool friends are going to, you know, come up with little solutions kind of biting away at the problem, but in terms of, like, absolute bright line, the government should do this or the government should stop doing that, he's very vague. In, in other words, some paternalistic elite is going right. to make sure this all works for us. Unelected, and they're not law professors, um, right? <laughs> the Andrews relief, but I mean, who are these people? And, and the other problem is that they're, I mean, again, I got to get back to the gender point because that's kind of what I do, um, is, is simply that, you know, a bunch of uh, white guy techies don't really understand necessarily some of the problems that women have on the internet. There really is a gender divide in terms of things like anonymous speech and anonymous threats that seems to have a much greater impact on women. And the solution needs to involve the identifying the problem, understanding the dimensions of the problem, and working towards solutions to the problem need to involve women in a much more dramatic way. That's not going to happen. Uh, it may not happen with the government, but it's definitely not going to happen, I think, with, with, with Zitron's crew. Well, and I want to take questions, but it seems okay. to me that the, the case you're making more generally is really about uh, recognizing that some people don't want to tinker, right? So Jonathan wants everyone to tinker. Not everybody wants to tinker. Right. And so really, uh, at a basic level, your critique and Adam's critique share a core similarity of recognizing that people are different. Right. And that, that, that having one group that's supposed to dictate from on high how these things work is not going to work well for everybody because right. of gender differences as well as just whether people are geeks, right. whether they want to come to an event like this and listen right. to law professors <laughs> talk about law boring law stuff. But right. And, and just w one quick please. point, I mean, just to me, it moves us in a completely different uh, uh, direction, so I don't want to get in too much into it, but I mean, there's also a part of Zitron's book that wants to impose the First Amendment on the whole world. And that's also, even though the First Amendment's a great thing and leaves a lot of benefit, imposing that on the world through the Internet's also going to be kind of problematic, right? Well, and in fact, that's another chapter in right. the book, uh, which we're going to have a future event on, so I, I encourage you to keep that in mind. Uh, I wanted to start taking questions from the audience. Remember that uh, a number of these themes will come up later today. That The next panel is really all about <laughs> deputizing intermediaries, and that's really what Frank uh, and Adam have a lot to say about. Uh, but uh, please, uh, I think Steve Del Bianco has a question. Thanks, Baron. Congratulations on the new launch and uh, the new book and fabulous panel. Really enjoyed the discussion. But in between optimism and pessimism, I think we're missing something. We're missing realism about the real problems on the Internet and the lack of urgency to solve them. And uh, our timing could not be worse. I'm talking about problems of crime, fraud, abuse, child porn, things that consumers and businesses are really frustrated about. We're frustrated about the inability of market forces and business self reg to solve those problems. Now, at the same time, we have in the lurking these governments who are desperate for some relevance in a new world that's borderless because of the internet. And what if business and citizens start to look at governments and say, well, they've, they've solved the financial crisis. They did okay on that. They've managed to avoid big terrorist attacks. They've even forced bad companies to clean up their oil spills. And business and citizens begin to gravitate and ask legislators to take action. That's happening while this debate's going on. I know because I deal with the fire hose of new bills coming out of state capitals and national capitals, and most of them are endorsed by some business somewhere and by citizen groups. So I feel like we're going to notice that, that, new, that uh, the UN wants to help the private sector manage the Internet, and government and citizens come together and, and come up with new legislation to solve these problems. So I would ask you, do you think there's an adequate realism about real problems on the Internet and a sufficient urgency on the part of civil society and business to avoid a next digital decade where governments come in and call all the shots? Well, I just have to respond to this this libertarian stuff um, <laughs> I mean this I, I think one of the things that you might think about is that the, the, and I agree with Clay Shirky here that the digital revolution is a very profound one it's a very deeply rooted one it's not just a technological revolution it's bound up with the emergence of post-industrial post conceivably even a post-capitalist order um, and uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the work of so many thinkers, you know, the work of Drucker. I mean, I don't quite frankly, again, you know, 
joking about law professors, but you know, Jonathan Zittrain, who I like and admire, I mean, he's not the only thinker on the internet. In fact, his book, I don't think, has been read by anyone outside. I haven't read it. It's not read by anyone outside law schools. Um, there are a lot of very important thinkers, someone like Peter Drucker, who thinks about knowledge and information society, who make much more important, I think, uh, points about where we're going than, 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 than some of our internet uh, specialists. And I think what somebody like Drucker talks about is the digital world as the next major step in um, social, cultural, economic evolution. Um, uh, after the, he, he compares the digital knowledge revolution to the industrial revolutions of the 1830s and the 1870s. And uh, this idea that, I mean, have, 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 did you study history in college, Adam? Uh, have you, have you, did. did you study the 19th century? Did you, did you look at the way in which the early history of an almost Darwinian capitalism had to be controlled by government and external agencies for us to get to a more civilized industrial capitalist order of the 20th century? So this idea that the market always solves everything and that history proves that if you just keep your hands off, everything works out, I think can be historically absolutely demolished. And I think if we, we look at the digital revolution in broader, more historical, more profound cultural and economic terms, then it's very, very difficult to take this libertarian argument seriously. So, so your answer to Steve's question is no or yes? <laughs> I don't know what the question was. <laughs> Adam, Adam, what's your response? To, to what? To, the, to Andrew's rant or <laughs> Steve's, Steve's well, question? I mean, what, what is your response to the idea that that Look, this yeah. is a major historical event that uh, when you compare it in historical terms, all previous major historical events require external agencies to control and manage. Yeah, Andrew, I'm not an anarchist. I mean, in, in my work, I've, I've made it clear. I, hell, I support intellectual property, for starters. That's, that's intervention of a sort. Uh, I support various types of FTC-based enforcement to uh, you know, deal with fraud and uh, various types of uh, deceptive things. Um, I've advocated through when I worked at Progress and Freedom Foundation a DACA model for communications reform that would have FTC-like powers transferred to the FCC to basically police uh, neutrality questions. I mean, th th there are room. There's room at the margin for forms of regulation. I, nobody's doubting that. The, the question is: is that the state? Is that you know going to be the standard upon which all of these decisions are made? Are we going to try to first look to preempt to head off this sort of progress? Uh, with a more static uh, stasis mentality that says, well, we got to really go slow with the change and, and uh, micromanage it at every juncture. I mean, that's, that's what I'm expressing in my chapters. But, you, but I think you're setting up, uh, and I've done this in the past, I don't deny it, but you're setting up these straw men. I mean, who's really saying that? Okay, I mean, well, let's, 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 actually, let me, let me cite your piece from 2007 in Ad Age, where we said we need to, quote, take steps to recreate media scarcity. That would be the first thing I'm against. <laughs> So I could move on to other parts of your book where you're constantly belittling, insulting the digital generation as being, quote, unquote, narcissistic and self-absorbed and everything else that people have hurled at youngsters for millennia. But, you know, these sorts of moral panics and chicken little tactics really don't be, are very becoming if you want to talk about the reality of the world as we know it and how to change it for the better. I think the answer to Steve's question is to embrace a more pragmatic form of optimism or realism that understands change can be disruptive and it can have downsides and unintended consequences, but to deal with them constructively, not by labeling the new generation, the lost generation, and the hell with those damn kids and their newfangled technologies. We've heard it all before from the waltz to rock and roll to the video games and the internet. And that's largely what I'm trying to debunk at my chapter. I, you know, one of the uh, kind of other parts of things that Zitron doesn't wrestle with and, and I think also needs to be raised too is, I mean, the government, at least the federal government, often like would prefer not to act and just kind of punt and let the market solve. I mentioned the antivirus before, but I mean, you know, if this was like a real virus and it's like the, the swine flu virus instead of a computer virus, the government's a little more interested in a public health approach. They're happy to sit back and, you know, all this money is generated by the antivirus uh, software um, another example was um, where maybe government's not even such a great thing is remember way back with the E-rate when, you know, Al Gore was vice president and he never really said he invented the internet. Now I feel sorry, sorry for him anyway because Tipper dumped him. But 
<laughs> he got all this money for schools and libraries to have the internet. And the next thing we know, McCain pioneers this thing with a sensorware, right? And the sensorware wasn't a one-time purchase. The sensorware is like constant every month. Libraries and schools have to pony up all this money to public, you know, to private companies that make this sensorware. Like, why didn't the government just, if they're going to say you have to censor your internet, we'll do it for you. Here's the software you install, and then we'll give you the money. The government's like very happy to sit back. And let the market get involved in this, and you know that can be pretty troubling too. Well, and, and it sounds like what you're really getting at is is one of the themes of, of Lessig's work and, and Tim's work, which is that government intervention and subsidies does tend to lead to government control. So when he, when Lessig talks about uh, perfect control, he also talks about the increased opportunity for regulation. That is the increased opportunity for government to come in and censor speech. Yeah. Well, I, I, my point actually was that the government both basically will intervene a little and then wants to sit back and just sort of let you know people make money off of whatever the situation is without actually solving the problem. Can, right? I, can, I, can I ask a question about this? You, know, you, you keep on talking about government intervention in media. Well, how would you describe, say, the BBC? Is that government intervention? Adam? Sure it is. Yeah. So you're saying that the BBC is the voice of what? The British government? That it's some sort of you know totalitarian. Well, like Andrew, I don't want to have a you know let's not have a no, fight but, over but, BBC and but, media but, subsidies. But, but, but you're throwing out these terms and you're assuming they're right and they're not right. I mean, the idea that government that that any kind of government intervention in media results in government censorship or government scrutiny isn't borne out in I necessarily. I didn't, well, what I didn't did say that. You can read my filing on this to the FCC, and I, and I make it clear that that's not been the case with a lot of subsidized media, that if you talk about the totality of media well, subsidies. So what's the, okay, so what's the problem then with the BBC? Well, are we going to have an argument about the BBC here? I mean, the problem with the BBC was that we only had a couple of them for about 50 years. That was the problem with the BBC. It crowded out the market for any competition. That was the biggest problem with it. Did it produce great journalism? You better believe it did. And I still watch a lot of it today, but thank God we have some alternatives to it. And you know what? At the end of the day, I'd rather not subsidize a person. I'd like to have that choice for myself. That's the difference. So Let's, you prefer YouTube. I think we should have another Let's question. Let's take another question from the audience <laughs> here. Please. This is a question for um, Frank Pasquale, Morgan Reed with ACT. It was interesting how you, uh, how when, when um, Adam set it up as the pessimist viewpoint. You tried to take it and claim it was the progressive viewpoint, which is interesting when you consider that um, at the 25th anniversary of the dot-com, Bill Clinton said that the most important decision that he made as president about the Internet was to realize it was a key um, um, mode of communication and then get out of the way. Uh, it's interesting as we look at the kinds of actions that people are concerned about, and Ann brought up the 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 problems with the walled garden AOL, and we've heard that, that generally speaking, the progressive viewpoint, wouldn't that be one that would say, let's do more, but let's watch behavior, <laughs> rather than preemptively prevent progress and, and move into this world where we're saying, thou shalt not, instead of starting off with, thou shalt, but maybe from a more regulatory framework, we're going to watch very carefully and start going after specific acts of behavior. So I wonder why, why that model of fear would be one that's... Uh, better identified with the progressives, and rather, maybe it's uh, maybe that's not a fair definition of the progressive viewpoint on the internet. Well, I, I do appreciate the historical context. I mean, I think that there was a real sea change under the Clinton administration in a lot of areas. Um, I think there was, on the side of both um, the financial sector and the internet sector, a lot of faith that there were people who were very wise, who knew a lot about math, who were in Silicon Valley and Wall Street, who would in a totally deregulated environment, do all that's right. Um, and I think that clearly the internet is doing a lot better than Wall Street. Clearly there's not certainly that type of, uh, sort of sort of meltdown that we've seen recently. But I think that the larger issue there, I think, is that right now my worry is that we don't even have the tools to understand if, they're problematic, if there's problematic behavior. I think there's just too many situations where you know, we just don't know enough about, say, how rankings are done or how what type of data is kept, auditing, other things like that. And I think that if we had more of a uh, an ability to monitor what's going on, my concerns would be assuaged. And this is not, I think, a radical position. I think that, you know, Danny Weitzner, who's at the, I think there's really interesting sort of tensions within the current administration uh, between, say, Department of Commerce and the FTC, Department of Commerce being, you know, a bit more industry-oriented than the FTC on a lot of privacy questions online, other questions like that online. But even within the Department of Commerce, I think that someone like Danny Weitzner at the NTIA, I believe, is uh, is someone who is very interested in trying to understand better what's going on in these internet intermediaries. So I think 
that would be the the movement I would make more towards an effort to say, do we really know there's not stealth marketing going on? Do you know? Do we really know that you know that all of the ad word auctions are on the up and up? What would it hurt to have a few audits of those things every once in a while? And I think that that's what's driving perhaps what's going on in Europe. And the larger lesson, I think, for American industry is that Europe, um, maybe we shouldn't allow Europe to become the de facto regulator when we sort of step out of the field, because that's what it may well do if, if we don't. Yeah. Transparency and prevention. Yeah, yeah, I think that the transparency and some auditing of, of, of industry practices would do a lot to assuage the concerns of, of, of folks like me and others. We have time for one more question. Uh, Jeff, John, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I'm Jim Dunstan, the founder of Mobius Legal Group and an adjunct to Tech, Tech Freedom, although I may de de depend after this question. But one thing that struck me, and I'd like the response to it, on the, the issue of dynamism, generativity, optimism in Silicon Valley, I was really struck by, Baron, the, the, the interview and then the, the comments here. If dynamism is, in fact, a way in which there is radical change, and yet optimism is coming out of Silicon Valley, if, in fact, dynamism is true, doesn't the whole model for Silicon Valley fall apart? Because don't, in fact, venture capitalists invest into these new businesses, not because they think they're going to be displaced in two or three years, but they think they're going to be the next Apple, they're going to be the next Microsoft, and have a generation of profits to, you know, to, to, to then get their earnings back from. If dynamism and generativity takes off in anything approaching a Moore's Law, doesn't it break down the entire Silicon Valley model? Yeah, so, so the question is, how long is a generation? And yeah. I, think, I think Adam would probably uh, agree with me here that what, what we're talking about is not the idea that, um, that nobody can achieve uh, domination in a marketplace, but, but the question of how long it lasts. And, and my answer is, yeah, if you look at, and I think, I think Tim Wu's book, Master Switch, is, is very accurate in this respect, that he basically describes uh, Schumpeter's theory of capitalism, where you have, especially in, in technologically dynamic industries, you have um, the rise of, of one giant in a field and then that is eventually replaced by another. And I think essentially what we're seeing is that the, the, the replacement times are becoming shorter. Right? So this is, this is somewhat akin to the, the uh, rapid pace or the increasing pace of technological change itself. And I'm fine with that. I, I, I think, and this is a really fundamental question here, right, is, is, and this is, I think, in part what Adam was getting at when he talked about critiquing the uh, static snapshot mentality. If you think that it, it's only fair or that consumers will only be protected if the marketplace looks like Adam Smith's perfect competition model, you're going to be very disappointed in digital markets. Um, and, and, and if you take that starting place, you're probably going to be led to argue for intervention. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, believe that uh, actually consumers can be protected pretty well in marketplaces where at any given time there may in fact only be one dominant player, um, but that the key question is how long that that dominant player can stay on top and whether there is the, the, the potential of someone lurking around the next corner to displace them. You can be very comfortable with technological change, and you can also understand why, to get to your very, I think, astute question, why venture capitalists are willing to fund companies that can stay on top for a while um, in, in hopes that either that generation, however short it is, is enough to justify their returns, or that that, that, that company may be the exception to the rule, right? Because every investor thinks that, that, they're, that the one that they're putting their money on, it's, it's in some sense betting, is the one that's going to last, even if history doesn't really bear that out. And in fact, if you take specific examples, you actually can re rebut Andrew Keene again, which, you know, those comments about law professors did burn. Um, <laughs> but like, take the music industry, okay? So we've seen, I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen, right, uh, eight track tapes, or it's like clunky, and then cassette tapes, and then, you know, CDs, and then the MP3 files. Um, but the music, the most important part of the music, the part, the part that sticks over time, is someone has to write the songs that we still don't have computers that write songs that anyone wants to listen to, so we have to make sure that people are still incentivized to write and perform the songs. That's the part that's constant. So that part, I mean, ensuring that we have all, all the, you know, the, the Napsters and the iTunes right. all have an incentive but, but to make that, sure songs are written. But, but the thing is, is that uh, if we had Rick Carnes here, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Rick Carnes. He's the uh, head of the American Songwriters Guild. So I'm not going to speak... I, let, me, let me just pretend I was Rick, if, if he was here. What he would say to you is that he has no problems with 
all these different technologies replacing one another because it didn't undermine the ability of the songwriter or the musician to earn a livelihood, whether it was the sale of vinyl or five, six track or CD or cassette. The problem that Rick would say is that in our internet environment, in this sort of anarchistic world where people are turning a blind eye to piracy, the ability for the songwriter and the musician to earn a living is going away. So that would be, uh, it's got nothing to do with technological pessimism. It's just a reality. That's the world he's living in. He's seeing more and more of his fellow songwriters losing their jobs because there simply isn't the opportunity. Now, you could argue, well, they're going to have to be policemen or they could become investors or they could become you know, other types of creative people. Law, perhaps law that's professors, true. Perhaps. Right, they could become law professors. But do we want to lose our, our songwriters? Do, do we want to, you know, we're living again at this really revolutionary cultural point where the hand workers of the old cultural system are being replaced by someone else. Now, I don't want to suggest that you have to, you can you can or you'd want to hold up history but this idea that you guys have that somehow history moves forward so quickly that anyone who even questions what's happening is a reactionary and a luddite is just as uh, as, as absurd as the as the ludditism that destroyed machines i mean we have to be able to criticize technological change because it's so central to our lives and one of the things that troubles me about your approach is you're treating it as if it's this sort of uh, uh, a game, a free market game, when it actually affects real people's lives in cultural terms, in the way they live their lives. And you have to acknowledge that. You can't just look at it purely as proof of the purity of the market. Well, I think Andrew's going to have to have the last word. Uh, for my part, I would simply say that you've heard plenty of criticism here today. So obviously, no one's trying to... Uh, to squelch criticism of change and also to, to be realistic, uh, as I think we're all trying to be, about the fact that change is hard and the question is, is how we deal with it. I think that's essentially Adam's message. That's certainly the message that we're going to be dealing with at, at Tech Freedom is not, um, it's not Pollyanna shopping optimism. It's a, it's a pragmatic and a rational one that, as, uh, as Steve's question was getting at, tries to grapple with real questions and look at the, at the least restrictive ways of dealing with them. So anyway, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. I encourage you to read their chapters in the book, uh, as well as the chapters of, uh, of others who contributed on these topics. Um, so I'd like to ask our, our second panel to come up um, on internet exceptionalism and the question of uh, deputizing and, and uh, requiring online intermediaries to police the internet. Uh, and while they're coming up here, I'm going to turn things over to Adam, but I do just want to say that... Um, uh, the question that was asked about the 25th uh, anniversary of the Internet did remind me that I was remiss in my introduction and remarks in mentioning that this book actually grew out of that anniversary. And I really have to thank uh, Shane Tews at uh, Verisign, who's sitting uh, somewhere here in the audience, uh, back here uh, on, on the right, I think. Um, this book was really a commemoration of the first 25 years of the commercial Internet. And a celebration, in that sense, of everything that dot-com uh, and the commercial internet symbolizes. So uh, it really wouldn't have happened without her support. So uh, Adam's going to moderate the next panel, uh, which I'm sure will be quite a uh, great debate. Thank you, Baron. Uh,